It's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that this technology cooked your eyes like eggs in World War II. And you all need to understand these are military weapons, these are assault frequencies. you garner nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare, this is what this is. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the National Press Club Federal Communications Commission Chairman Tom Wheeler. It's an honor uh, to be here um, at the National Press Club. The first generation wireless 1G was voice. The second generation 2G allowed both talk and text. Third generation, 3G, the internet, in a limited way. And today's technology, 4G, completed that digital migration. But if anyone tells you that they know the details of what 5G is going to become, run the other way. This video is brought to you by the number 5 and the letter G. And pretty soon, everything else will be too. I have to tell people 5G is a killer. I'm Mark Steele. Anybody who hasn't heard me, I'm a weapons systems head up display expert, I'm one of the leading experts in the world. I've actually broke cover in relation to this, and the reason I became an expert was because I invent them. What I'm going to say to you today do not believe a single word I say. Not one. I want you to do your own research. You'll find it's absolutely terrifying. You got your body cut? Aye, aye, aye. Oh, good lad. Right, because I can talk to that. This 5G roll up is a weapon system. I've got a letter and we sent the government because I know about weapon systems more than anything other. In uh, Britain, in a place in the uh, north of England called Gateshead, uh, a scientist there called Mark Steele has been um, very publicly and actively warning people about the effects of LED streetlights, which he says in Gateshead are emitting now 5G. Right, we're away. what's the crack? Yeah, I'm just having a word with these Gateshead Council workers about replacing this, uh, this, these transmitters on these lights that are causing harm and uh, assault in the community. This is an existential threat to the economy, to the environment, and humanity. With these transmitters are everywhere, then everyone's at risk, surely. There's a lot of confusion about what 5G is. The G stands for generation. So you started off with the first uh, transmitter system. Back in the 1980s. In the 80s, yeah. So you had 1G, then you had 2G. And as the generations moved on, you started to see uh, more uh, complex uh, signal systems, uh, cleverer uh, pieces of uh, you know antenna designs, etc., etc. So the whole thing became uh, more data, quicker data, quicker downloads, etc, etc. However, 5G is something completely different. Alright, let's get a breakdown. Let's tell the people what this really is. This is the 5G transmission device. That's a hell of a beast, that, isn't it? These are the uninsurable transmitters. Just get a good look at that, guys, because obviously I know there's quite a few experts who want to see uh, more detail about the transmitters and the chipsets. Just have a good look, boys. This is the control management system, mass radio. There's an antenna there, you see that? 
What is this? Fears the rear antenna here. What's that? This is for fears the rear. All right. As you'll see, it's got a driver. It's got some chip there. It's one chip. Look at the chip set on this. This is your dystopian world. What did this? What did Gated Council say? I'll tell you what I think. We better send some of these educated fools back to school, or just send them to prison, whichever is the easiest. I think prison's probably better. All right. That's 5G, guys. That's 5G hardware. You must consider the whole part played by electricity in nature. Human beings cannot go on developing in the same way in an atmosphere permeated on all sides by electric currents and radiations. It has an influence on the whole development of man. This life of men in the midst of electricity, notably radiant electricity, will presently affect them in such a way that they will no longer be able to understand the news which they receive so rapidly. The effect is to damp down their intelligence. Such effects are already seen today. Even today, you can notice how people understand the things that come to them with far greater difficulty than they did a few decades ago. Rudolf Steiner, 1924. Rudolf Steiner noted that in 1924. Since then, our atmosphere has become far more permeated with electric waves of widely diverse types. There's no doubt now that electric waves, electromagnetic forces, cause direct biological effects. There's thousands of peer-reviewed papers on this subject. There's no doubt about it. But what are these effects? How are they affecting us? What can we do about it? We're now at a stage where we're putting in what's called 5G, which is a special type of broadcast for high density information transfers. And it turns out that this is the same frequency bands that are used in crowd dispersal weaponry. Five G, first and foremost, is densification. So it's significantly more transmitters at close proximity to uh, a human, and it is also a sophisticated, illegal, unlawful transmitter. What I mean by that is it is a high gain dielectric lens antenna, and what that allows five G transmitters to do is to 3D map its environment in your home. The 868 megahertz frequency is specific for battlefield interrogation systems, so sub gigahertz. It allows the signal to travel through concrete brickwork with ease, and it can actually uh, data gather. It is a target acquiring system. Phase to rear is basically radar off the battlefield. It is extremely good at identifying targets and being able to lock on the targets. And not only that, it can specifically target you as an individual. So any judge sitting on a, uh, an interesting case, let's say, any lawyer, any barrister, anybody doing any work that is potentially controversial, your life could be a threat. So the antenna design that you currently have on top of these LED streetlights masquerading as a control management system is basically battlefield interrogation equipment. The first phase of the rear unit was actually called Mammut, used by the Germans during the Second World War to identify Allied aircraft. Obviously things have moved on significantly since then. I joined the Royal Navy uh, in 1960 and I specialised in microwave warfare. Uh, radar, obviously, which uses microwave, but they don't just teach you radar, they teach you all about microwaves and other uses. So I understood about microwave warfare and how it can damage people, how it can harm people. The microwaves then were used as weapons, as they are today. It is a, a perfect stealth weapon. And when governments don't like a group of people, 
For instance, the, the ladies who protest at Greenham Common in England about the American missile base they camped, they were microwaved. We microwaved Catholics in Northern Ireland to make them sick. Uh, it, it goes on all over the world. And it, it's a weapon that you don't know you're being targeted because the dose is very, very low, which is actually more dangerous than a high dose. It's very, very low and it may take a year or two, but you can, you can cause neurological damage and cancers with low level microwaves and you can make all your opponents sick. It, it's a perfect weapon for a government. Our impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. Their intention to rule rests with the annihilation of consciousness. We have been lulled into a trance. They have made us indifferent to ourselves, to others. We are focused only on our own game. Please understand, they are safe as long as they are not discovered. Keep us asleep, keep us selfish, keep us sedated. Almost immediately, I had neighbors knocking on the door, uh, talking about children bleeding from the nose. I had images posted on Facebook. And one neighbor in particular came to my door and mentioned the fact that since the LED street lighting had been installed, she was bleeding from the nose every single night. I thought it was unbelievable. However, I spoke to another neighbor who lived not far from the first lady who mentioned this, and she also confirmed that since the LED street lighting had been installed, she also had started to develop nosebleeds and had never had nosebleeds before in her life. That then put me on a journey to investigate. I measured microwave radiation levels from the transmitters uh, on top of the LED streetlights. Uh, the basic 868 megahertz, it was significantly higher than the current Council of Europe 1815 resolution, which is a maximum of 600 millivolts. I've measured up to th over 3,000 millivolts. Uh, five times, five to six times higher than the than the guidelines. Significantly higher than, than the current Council of Europe 1815 resolution, which states that 200 millivolts should be the maximum. The Bio Initiative report states that it should be significantly less than that. So we've got the Council of Europe that's, you know, the, 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 the international criminal courts are stating that, you know, the learned judges have said that 200 millivolts and I'm measuring in bedrooms in Gateshead, minimum, minimum 600 and up to 4,000. Does this mean that in 2020, 2021, when 5G is destined to roll out globally, that you're going to get those kind of readings everywhere all the time? Everywhere all the time. Worse than that? Worse than that. Yes, 5G will connect the internet of everything. If something can be connected, it will be connected in the 5G world. Hundreds of billions of microchips connected in products from pill bottles to plant waterers requiring massive deployment of small cells. We won't wait for the standards. Now to make this work, five, the 5G build out is going to be very, infrastructure intensive. We must reject the notion that the 5G future will be the sole provenance of urban areas. The 5G revolution will touch all corners and that's damn important. The interconnected world of the future will be the result of decisions we must make today. issue before us today is Senate Bill 637 and Senate Bill 894, uh, the former by Senator Hugh and the latter by Senator Knopfs. We're going to invite the uh, first four witnesses in support of the legislation, and that would be John Jones with Sprint, David Lewis and Andy Emerson with AT&T, Neil Krevda with Verizon, and Frank Alcavetti Jr. with T-Mobile. So be straight with me. Is it true? 
It could be. No, well, come very, on. It's, it's, you know, very no few cases. Proof there was all. an unfortunate really uh, incident out in situation. Iowa. Oh, Look, gentlemen, have... practice these words in front of the mirror. Although we are constantly exploring the subject, currently there is no direct evidence that links cell phone usage to brain cancer. I'm Sharon Goldberg. I'm an internal medicine physician. I've practiced medicine for 21 years, and my background is mostly academic, internal medicine, hospital-based, clinical research, and medical education. I'm a certified Microsoft small business specialist. I've worked on space station designing the cabling system for the airlock module, where I was responsible for EMI, EMC analysis, which is electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic compatibility. I am a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health, and I teach there both toxicology and health effects of electromagnetic radiation. My name is Daphne Tachover, and I'm the founder of an organization called We Are the Evidence. Uh, we are an organization that represents the many adults and unfortunately many children who have become very sick from wireless technology radiation. There seems to be a couple false Easter eggs being put out there right now. I want to make sure we dispel that right off the gate. The effects of wireless on health scientifically are very, very clear. So it's always pushed back to the definition of an acceptable level of radiation. And that's what this is, by the way. This is about radiation. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. My name is Dr. Angie Kolbeck. I've been reviewing the studies showing the impacts of wireless radiation on our health, and there are now thousands of studies showing the following adverse health impacts to wireless radiation. Cancer, oxidative damage, DNA damage, DNA failure. Things like you know, memory, uh, dizziness, anxiety, brain fog. Headaches, nosebleeds, cognitive problem, exhaustion. We have evidence of DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congestive heart failure. Short and long-term memory loss, decreased attention spans, lower reaction times, um, even involuntary contractions of muscles causing misalignments of spines and jaws. Breast cancer. We suddenly have breast cancer in women who have no DNA predisposition. Disrupted immune function and change in stress proteins. Reproductive and fertility effects. There are dozens and dozens of studies that show beyond any doubt what this uh, radiation is doing to our sperm. Now, if you take this, the, the cell phone out of your pocket, the sperm will recuperate within three to four months. What would not recuperate would be the damage to the DNA of the sperm. That is irreparable. The wife of the ex-governor of, of Indiana was diagnosed with glioblastoma. Same brain tumor Ted Kennedy had and John McCain had. Did you look at John McCain's car? This is a cell phone brain tumor. Um, LeBron James, one of our sports people, had a salivary gland tumor. That is another cell phone uh, uh, tumor. You didn't hear about it because immediately after that was discovered, he would pay, was paid by Samsung to become their spokesperson. We are seeing increases in, in brain tumors. Uh, we're seeing increases in Alzheimer's. We're seeing increases in uh, all of the neurotransmitter diseases, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, Parkinson's. These are all disease systems that are known to be associated with low-level energy exposures. We talk about 24-7, around-the-clock exposure, whatever you are and your whole body. You never get away from it. And it seems from our studies that maybe your immune system can cope with it for a time, but it will deteriorate. Then the irradiation will definitely damage cells at a deeper level, and the question is what will then happen? These are out of peer-reviewed papers, so these are not just hypochondriacs thinking that they're doing it. We're having real problems with this. This is no longer a subject for debate when you look at PubMed and the peer-reviewed literature. These effects are seen in all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes. So 5G is not a conversation about whether or not these biological effects exist. They clearly do. There is scientifically evidence that is so strong that you can be certain that the standards used by the FCC to manage health effects are wrong. We need to start measuring how much radiation are people being exposed to? 
before we roll out 5G. There are four kinds of electromagnetic fields that we know are harmful to human health. So radio frequency radiation, magnetic fields, dirty electricity, and electric fields, okay? Our exposure, any given person, and all humans are affected by EMFs. What is our exposure in a, in a day? It's not one cell phone. It's cell phones, it's multiple wireless networks, it's smart meters, it's cell towers. It's this sandwich and it all adds up. The data we're gonna look at are all published science, testing results, or public standards. At the bottom end of the radiation scale of what's called power density or signal strength is the minimum level at which cell phones will work which was found to be 0.2 billionths of a microwatt per centimeter squared. Pine needles were found to age prematurely at 0.000027. At short-term exposures of 0.05, children aged 8 to 17 experienced headache, irritation, concentration difficulties, and behavioral problems. 0.1 is the bow biology or building biology guideline for extreme concern. 1.0 produced sperm DNA fragmentation and a decrease in sperm viability in vitro. Also at 1.0, the science shows the following bodily effects can occur. Headaches, dizziness, fatigue, insomnia, chest pain, difficulty breathing, and indigestion. 2.5 saw altered calcium metabolism in heart muscle cells. 4.0, changes in the hippocampus affecting brain memory and learning. And at 6.0, DNA damage in cells. So, where are smart meters on this list? Electrical Power Institute in December 2010 measured a single ITRON smart meter with pulses up to 7.93 microwatts per centimeter squared. Our own testing indicated approximately 8.0 with one meter. These tests are at a close distance, approximately one foot away from the meter, but an infant's crib could be just as close on the other side of the wall where the meter or bank of meters are installed. Even though there are all these known health effects at levels far lower, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Luxembourg see fit to set the standard at 9.5. And China, Poland, and Russia, 10.0. This is the same level at which behavior has been altered, producing reflexes of avoidance following 30-minute exposures. A room of 12 smart meters, very common and even a conservative number in an apartment building, tested at 19.8 microwatts per centimeter squared. This is hundreds of times higher than levels which clearly indicate harmful effects. So how can utilities and governments get away with forcing these devices on everyone? This is how. In Canada and the US and several other civilized countries, the safety limit is set at 600 to 1000 microwatts per centimeter squared. This so-called safety limit is literally tens of thousands of times higher than levels which are known to damage health according to peer-reviewed published science. Faster, better, more reliable internet. That's the promise of 5G technology, but there is also the peril. Health hazards associated with radio frequency that is higher also and requires more transmitters and in antennas. And the stark, simple fact is the health hazards are unknown and unstudied. And that is a sign of neglect and disregard on the part of the Federal Communications Commission that seems unacceptable. There have been no answers so far. The FCC basically has said everything's fine, but in order to reach a conclusion about the health and safety of this new technology, we need facts. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for having this hearing. Uh, 5G, as you well know, also uses higher frequency waves that don't travel as far and will rely on a network of hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of small cell sites. And the question then is, are there any health implications, any public safety implications to those additional sites that are likely to be located close to homes, schools, workplaces, and closer and closer to the ground, correct? 
Correct, Senator. Yes. So my question for for you, particularly Mr. Gillen and Mr. Perry, um, how much money has the industry committed to supporting additional independent research? I stress independent research. Is that independent research ongoing? Has any been completed? Where can consumers look for it? Um, and we're talking about research on the biological effects of this new technology. Thank you, Senator. I, I think uh, thank you for your focus on the issue. Uh, safety is paramount, and as you alluded to, we rely on the expert agencies. We rely on the findings of the FDA and others as to the requirements to keep all of us safe. Uh, there are no industry back studies, to my knowledge, right now. Happy to visit with you as to what. Uh, opportunities you think there needs to be more studies and we're always for more science we also rely on what the scientists tell us so essentially the answer to my question how much money zero uh, I can so for only follow up with you senator to my knowledge there's no active studies being backed by industry today anybody else know of industry commitments to to back research fund it, support it, to ascertain scientifically the health effect. No, I'm not aware of any. So there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here so far as health and safety is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're a trained medical professional. Yes. We don't have one on the panel. What are we to make with, uh, of the American Cancer Society, for example, telling us there's no evidence of, of uh, harmful product? Many of these organizations have conflicts of interest. Very briefly, if you can, what do you, what's your definite, what do you mean by conflict of interest? One of the first things that you teach residents is that you always have to look at the funding. There's a tremendous amount of sponsored research by people who are hired to do studies to find no effect. And that's plagued this field in a number of countries. The radio frequency radiation work that we did was supported by Motorola. The relationship was really very cordial and very stress-free, but only up until we started generating data. They, these folks were very, very upset and began to talk about how are they going to handle this, what sort of spin can we put on this, what can we expect from this, and from that point on the relationship changed. And what we saw was that Motorola began to exert more and more control over the work, telling us what to do, telling us how to write abstracts, what to say in the abstracts, what to say in the papers, how to do the work. No don't do this, yes, do it this way, this was unacceptable. I had completed our study of DNA damage and I submitted the final report to Motorola. They simply weren't willing to accept my interpretation of my study, my evaluation of my study, my knowledge of science at that point, and tried to urge me not to publish the study. Did you hear about people coming to you as far as, uh, as, far as having complaints about uh, illness? We were made aware of health complaints following installation of smart meters and we wanted to verify this uh, using our field work. So I measured the field of about 30 different people while they stood one foot in front of the smart meter and in every single case the uh, human energy field was obliterated as they stood in front of the smart meter. So in our first slides what we see is normal cells and the structure of the cells is intact and sound. This is what we would expect from a normal sample. So after two minutes of exposure in front of the smart meter at about one foot away we see a totally different story. Sample one you can see a lot of degradation in the cells. The cell walls have been broken and you see changes in the cells which are called mycoplasma. It shows a mutation to the cell. In the second sample, we see a different type of degradation to the cell membranes. You can see a corrugation here. This is called bottle cap formation. 
and it's known that this occurs due to oxidation or uh, exposure to free radicals. So this third subject, uh, when we did her sample, she had to be pulled away from the meter after 45 seconds because she complained about an increasingly severe headache. And here you see a phenomenon called rouleau, where the red blood cells are stacking up, which makes it very difficult for the blood to deliver oxygen to the tissues as they would be their normal function. Every single one of these is a degradation. Every single one of these shows a trauma to the blood cells and that came from something and the only variable was the smart meter. The good news in all this is the patient and the blood can return to normal once they have been removed from the influences of these stressors. Some of the effects um, that we can look at, well, one thing is, is just our regular Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz. That's in the same range as microwave ovens, which are also called radar ranges, because that is radar. 2.4 gigahertz is interesting. It's not the peak absorption rate in water for uh, microwave frequencies, but it's at a point where it allows full penetration, because if it came in at the peak, it would prevent the insides from getting warm. So that's with basic Wi-Fi. Now when we look at 5G, 60 gigahertz, this is um, what they call active dispersal sort of weaponry, just to keep people back. It burns the skin, it doesn't penetrate, but 60 gigahertz is the frequency of oxygen molecule absorption. Since um, they have electrons that they share with each other, what we breathe is actually O2 pair of oxygen, so being bombarded with 60 gigahertz could very well impair our oxygen absorption rate in our body and thereby the whole basis of our living system. Martin Paul says, putting tens of millions of 5G antennas without a single biological test of safety has to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world. So assessing all this, we have experts in various fields, military EMF weaponry, biological effects on humans, firefighters that are getting cognitive impairment by being there in them, countries that are banning these sort of technologies around schools because of the impairment to cognitive. Let's weigh that up in light of what Rudolf Steiner said in 1924 about just mere radio causing the impairment of cognitive functions on people, that they can receive news from around the world, but they can't understand it as well because of the effect of the electricity. We have to say, something smells sinister here. With the fifth generation, it's actually a whole new ball game. It's not using the same technology. They use, they're switching to uh, military grade millimeter wave technology. And when you look at this technology, I mean, if you go and look at DARPA reports, come and look at some of the patents that the United States military has put out on what they can do with um, psychological weapons, all sorts of things, crowd control, active denial, anything you can think of, this is what they can do with 5G. So any type of military application you can think of which is, has an electromagnetic base, they can do with 5G. And they're putting this out blanket across the population. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes.
The FCC is a capture agency. They probably conducted what I believe to be the biggest fraud on the public ever conducted. The FCC has been described by Harvard University's uh, Center for Ethics writer Norman Alster as the most captured agency in DC, acting more as a uh, industry cheerleader than a regulator. Um, this is especially true today with 5G, where there are serious safety concerns and potentially misleading information coming from the FCC. For example, the previous chairman of the FCC is Tom Wheeler. He was the head of the Wallace Lobby Association for 14 years. Now remember, Obama told us there would be no lobbyists in his administration, so he took the biggest lobby and put him as a, a head of the FCC. And that's damn important. In 1993, the FCC started a rulemaking to adopt the IEEE regulations on this issue. IEEE is an engineer association. Why is it that we adopt regulation of engineers who maybe know how to measure this radiation when it's passing a wall, but not when it's passing a body? All our health agencies objected it, saying that it makes no sense to adopt engineer association that they had not even one biomedical person on their, on their team. They are effectively indemnified against adverse health impact lawsuits when the uh, acceptable limits are higher than the limits actually shown to show harmful health effects. The FCC guidelines were developed for short-term exposures, six minutes, 30 minutes, depending on it's a phone or an outdoor exposure, and they have absolutely no connection to the biological effects that have been very clearly summarized in the bio initiative. So as you can see, there's a number of individuals in this room today that have uh, serious concerns about this uh, as regards to their health. If uh, one of your companies decides to uh, put one of these small cells up at a pole that's within, say, 50 feet of one of their houses, what recourse do they have uh, to say, is there a way to move it somewhere else? Um, there, there's language in the bill so that the authority can require the applicant to come forth with certification of compliance with the FCC's rules related to radio frequency emission. Remember that denial of request or denial permit request that you can put in? It's going to point back to the acceptable levels as determined by the FCC. Not the EPA and not the CDC, the ones who usually take care of health concerns, but by the FCC, which is staffed by former F, um, members of the telecommunication industry. That's the fox guarding the hen house. It's a fact that most insurance companies will not indemnify against EMF effects. Telecom companies around the world are warning their investors of potential major costs due to real or alleged risks of EMF pollution from their products. Interestingly enough, they're warning their investors, but they're not telling their customers. They're basically keeping it quiet because that's where their money comes from. So we're using technology that could be very potentially harmful to us, and the investors know it. But their only worry is that they might lose money, not that our health might be affected. First of all, I think the, the, what you should really think about is why is it that they're not insured? It's not that they chose to be self-insured, they're actually rejected by the insurance company from being insured because they understand the risk. And so the insurance the companies, risk, the big insurance companies, yeah, so will not okay, insure the telecommunications? Okay, so there's insurance companies and then there's what's called secondary insurance companies. Secondary insurance companies are the insurance companies that insure the insurance companies. So in an event, an insurance company, let's say, uh, I insure Verizon, and it may not be able to meet the claims, then the secondary insurance company is kicking in. Like Lloyds yeah. of London. Sorry? Like yes, Lloyds of exactly. London. So two uh, leading one would be Lloyds of London and Swiss Re. Both told the insurance company not to insure the wireless industry, and this is why they're not insured. And that should give you a hint. Now, this is exactly why they have to prevent a uh, health in, uh, uh, lawsuit. And how did they prevent lawsuit? That goes back to section 704. Section 704 was passed in 1996. This is how our rights in regards to health were taken away by the wireless industry. What this legislation did, it gave the power to regulate the health effects of wireless technology to the FCC. FCC is a spectrum auctioning agency. It's not a health agency. They don't even have one biomedical person on their team. And then the other thing that Section 704 did, 
It actually took the power from the state to regulate location of cell towers based on health. And what does it mean? It means that if they want to put a cell tower in front of your home, you cannot go to your city council and say, hey, stop, I don't want it. I just heard in a lecture that there are 10,000 studies proving that it's harmful. I don't want it. My child is sick. They would tell you, stop. You're not allowed to mention this in the city council because Section 704 says that if you will, and if the application will be rejected, the city will be sued, can be sued by the wireless industry. A major U.S. government study on rats finds a link between cell phones and cancer. Very first government study linking the radiation from cell phones to cancer. Two decades, $30 million federal study out today found there is some evidence of a link between cell phone radiation and brain cancer. Yes, sir, what is the NDP? I've heard that study several times. NDP is what? So it's a $25 million study on the rats and mice that was supposed to demonstrate that there were no effects of radiation below thermal. And in fact, it demonstrated exactly the opposite. And it follows on the heels of two major studies on animals that said exactly the same thing. And that study was designed perfectly to make sure that it cannot be a challenge, that there will not be any doubt. That's why it took them 14 years. That's how they prevent a discussion of health. And why do they want to dis prevent discussion of health if there's no problem with health? Um, simply put, FCC is completely unprepared, unable, and possibly unwilling to oversee 5G for safety, even as it barrels toward us. They are falling back on tired definitions and panaceas long since disproven by science. To make matters worse, recent FCC rulings and numerous industry-friendly bills passed at state and federal levels between 2016 and 2018 removed the last vestiges of local and state review over infrastructure siting, just when we need it the most. When those first studies were performed years and years ago, nobody knew about the importance of the microbiome, uh, the role of the microbiome and the immune system, and even less, the role of the microbiota inside our brains, that is the microbes that are normally resident inside our brains, whose influence on brain function is nothing but immense. And you may think, well, who cares about the microbes? The less microbes we have, the better it is. Well, we, we know by now that this is not absolutely the case because microbes are truly essential for the development and function of all our organs and systems. Our immune system is based on the microbes we have in our gut. And our brain also has microbes that influence its function. In tests, it's been found things like mold. If you grow mold inside a Faraday cage, it'll grow one way, and then even if the electromagnetic fields are around, take the Faraday cage away, and some sort of 600 biotoxins are developed within the mold because of the effects of the EMFs upon it. Electromagnetic fields, even of weak quality, have an effect upon our microbiome, which is really essential to our whole being. This is going to eviscerate microbial DNA inside human beings, which is our effective operating system, number one. So it may not impact human DNA in laboratory experiments right now, and they're saying it doesn't impact human DNA. But given that human DNA is less than 1% of the cellular DNA in the human body, the rest of the cellular DNA is microbial, and we know that this will eviscerate microbial DNA. So we're talking about a takedown of the operating system of human beings. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. I couldn't have put it better myself. John Brandt. Good morning, Mr. Brandt. Wow, my, uh, this is Amanda. From oh, Virginia. hi, how are you? Hi, I've been trying to get a hold of you for months now. You guys are covering up chemtrails. No, we are not covering up. We have, we have no reason to cover up chemtrails. Of course you have every reason to cover it up. Every reason. Let's call what reason would that be? Oh, well, you personally, I'm, uh, you would lose your job if you were to, to reveal anything to me. And it's probably unsafe for you to even be speaking about this, considering no, the a, types of individuals you work for. It's, it's not unsafe. There's, it is unsafe. There's no, because, no problem with us talking on, you know, you're a citizen, you're making a complaint. Oh, a complaint Lord, I'm working on myself. It's a complaint in an area that, that we, don't, uh, we don't have authority to regulate. Thank you.
So the connection between chemtrails and 5G? It's all interconnected. Uh, the metallized particulates, uh, that would allow the 5G phase to race, so basically the radar, it would allow it to be able to identify you, so it can watch you, it can identify you in your own home, 20 hours a day, seven days a week. For the last X amount of years, we've been through chem trailing, and that is now the cat is out of the box. We've had these nanoparticulates raining down on humanity for years now, impregnating our bodies, by best accounts staying inside our bodies. Those nanoparticulates, what you're saying, are creating, a building up a kind of a phosphorescence glow capability so that we can be flagged up in our homes, behind concrete and steel, inside bunkers, in the basement, doesn't matter where you are. The 5G will be able to now triangulate, map and read you because you as a living being are impregnated with these nanoparticulates which are acting as a kind of transmission and reception technology. It's exactly, absolutely exactly. You have to consider that DNA also works as a fractal antenna which is able to send and receive and also to process signals under the form of radio frequencies, well then there is no doubt that artificial radio frequencies such as those of cell towers and in particular these new types of towers that have a much higher density of signals, they may somehow interfere with the ability of DNA to retain and transmit biological signals. So this is one level of danger that very few uh, biologists are aware of. How much effort was put forward to address this, uh, the other, the, what most of these people are, or many of these people are here for, which are the health concerns. Uh, was there any uh, dialogue back and forth? Was there any working, uh, was there many, many studies evaluated to look at regarding this area? Maybe. Um, not every person that has concerns in the legislation was brought to the table. Okay, so from your perspective, you feel that there was a legitimate amount of time to evaluate the data that the, uh, the opposition would have on this? Absolutely, and I, um, I wouldn't put forth something that I didn't believe in. Um, and I'll tell you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and it's been commented several times amongst the panel here, this is truly an economic development issue. Our three-year-old, again at home, <laughs> is outraged when we pull out the driveway and he's not able to access Wi-Fi. I think anyone who puts Wi-Fi into a school should be locked up for the rest of their life. I really do. I think they're not fit to walk on the surface of this planet because they haven't looked at the research and whatever incentive they have it is not worth the genetic problems that parents are going to face with their children when they're born. France has banned Wi-Fi in nursery schools and put warnings out for regular schools uh, because they're finding there's impaired learning capacity in children when they're around Wi-Fi. And they have to put up warning signs where they put Wi-Fi transmitters. Um, when I got sick and I learned that they're putting Wi-Fi in the schools in Israel, um, I was very sick at the time, but I could not tolerate the thought that children in the schools will become as sick as I have. And after a few months of uh, correspondence, I submitted a Supreme Court case in Israel to ban the use of Wi-Fi in the schools and replace them with wired network. The four top diseases that kill our children, our young adults right now, are brain tumors, thyroid cancer, testis cancer, rectal cancer, everywhere we put our cell phones. And a lot of our children are sick and they've been misdiagnosed and mistreated because the wireless industry has put billions and billions of dollars in the past 30 years to mislead the public as to the health effects and keep the public uninformed. We are performing an experiment on children we are exposing children to microwave radiation for six hours during every school day. We have had absolutely no studies looking at the long-term effects of this radiation on young people or even on adults. A considerable amount of research shows that developing brains and bodies of children are much more affected than adults. And there are clear indications of a link between increased electromagnetic fields and autism spectrum disorders.
We took 10 autistic children and went back to the sleeping location where the mother was when she was pregnant with that child and compared it with the sleeping location of a mother that gave birth to healthy children. We had 10 mothers in that group, 10 mothers in this group, and in the group of the autistic children, we found that the, the measurements that we got for the microwave exposure was elevated compared to the group of children that were normal. The fetus is affected. The exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields has become the first factor that could be isolated ever in autism that could predict autism. The fifth generation of wireless technology, or 5G as it's being rolled out worldwide without safety testing. Let me say that again, without safety testing. And how we've got scientists and doctors and environmental organizers saying, stop this. Because in terms of the effects of wireless radiation, the science is in. Wireless radiation can lead to cancerous heart tumors, uh, brain tumors, uh, DNA damage, Wireless radiation is linked to infertility, to autism, Alzheimer's, and more. And guess what? All the effects that I just listed, those are some of the effects that are known according to the technology that's being seen today. First of all, you have to know that we know that the other EMFs that we're exposed to are already known to be health risks. And, uh, and basically that 5G, because of the frequency that's gonna be used, and because of the extraordinarily high pulsation levels that will be used uh, is uh, a much bigger threat to our health than the things that we already have, which are very substantial threats to our health. We're not just talking about the intensity. We're talking about the frequency and the very high level of pulsations. There's a huge literature which shows that pulsed EMFs, EMFs that pulse up and down very rapidly, are in most cases much more biologically active than our non-pulsed EMFs. Every single wireless communication device communicates via pulsations, but the industry completely ignores this issue. The problem with 5G is that they're planning to put out tens of millions of these antennae all over the place without doing one single biological safety test. Are you implying possibly that we, the consumers, are the guinea pigs since they haven't really done tests to see the effects in a smaller setting? I mean, that's not an implication, it's a statement. We are, yes. Cancer is not the main concern that I have. I'm really concerned about sperm count and about effects on pregnancy. How many of you know that one in six American couples is unable to have a child when they want to? How many of you know that last year, the birth rate in this country dropped the most that it ever has in recent history? 3% in a single year. People look at the sperm in people use cell phones and the sperm, usually sperm swim and they swim straight. But if you expose them to radio frequency, uh, mobile phone uh, waves, they swim in circle. <laughs> Studies have been done here in Australia taking sperm from healthy men and one test tube gets exposed to cell phone radiation and one test tube is not exposed to mobile phone radiation. And then the results are evaluated. And this is a measure of vitality. We measure how well the sperm swim. This is a measure of mobility, motility. This is a measure of mitochondrial DNA damage. They have three times as much damage on their DNA if they have been exposed to mobile phone radiation. The data on that are rock solid. Cell phones can damage sperm quantity and quality. Your embryo, your uterus in the fetus, where your child is developing for the first 100 days, in the ovaries, the eggs do not have that protection. So they are at maximum risk from radiation. And for the first month or so, you wouldn't even know you were pregnant. You wouldn't even be taking precautions. That is the main danger area. So you give birth to a daughter, but her ovaries are now contaminated. She may be normal, she may be genetically damaged, but her ovaries are at the most risk. So when your daughter grows up 
and she becomes pregnant and has a baby, this is where one of these eggs will be fertilized and come out. So the real damage here is your grandchildren. That is where it is going to show most. Do you think that there is a chance that within the third generation of females, they may be irreversibly sterile? Not in the third generation, but in the fifth generation, and that would for humans be something in the order of 150 years ahead of us. And of course, then it's too late to say that you are sorry, and it's very too late to say stop. There is a wealth of papers, I mean we're talking about thousands of published papers in the scientific literature, few of which or sometimes none of which have entered the official documentations from authorities and likewise. So I think it's really time to have an independent compilation of data. Such was done at August 31st, 2007 in the form of the Bioinitiative Report of which I was one of the authors. And then we put together approximately 2,000 scientific references on a little bit more than 600 pages, clearly saying that if you, for instance, if you are a rat or a mouse or a cell or a molecule, you should definitely not allow yourself to be exposed to this. And in the meantime, we have this full-scale experiment using our own kids. One interesting case, John Patterson, he was a telecommunications engineer in Sydney, Australia. Very brilliant man. For 20 years, John tested Telstra digital systems. Over the time, he realized the dangers of electromagnetic radiation. It disrupts the bioelectric system of your body, which is really your brain, your nervous system, how your muscles talk. And he tried warning of these effects through different agencies, through his company. Got all the test gear out and measured it and drew up a report. And uh, I was immediately removed from service. Finally, in um, 2007, he took matters into his own hand. He commandeered a used British Army tank and went and destroyed six cell phone towers in Sydney, Australia, because he wanted to stop this. He was trying to make a point. The message was that how dangerous it was. You know, these people were elected by us to manage our infrastructure in a responsible manner. That is the sole purpose of government if it's going to exist at all. And if it doesn't do that, then it has no right. It is invalid. So we need to pull this infrastructure down. We really do. But in order to do that, I mean, we can't just be some violent domestic terrorist. You've got to, you've got to bring this awareness to the people that these towers are doing them damage. You don't need bandwidth that fast. And they're not doing it so you can download movies quickly. They're doing it so they can track every single thing you do and bring in this social crediting system to control even everything you think. The story about a lady called Claire Edwards, she was a United Nations staff member and she was warning of uh, the potentially uh, catastrophic uh, dangers of 5G technology. I took issue or took the issue to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He is a physicist and electrical engineer had lectured on telecommunication signals early in his career, yet asserted to me that he knew nothing about the dangers of 5G. Current public exposure levels are at least one quintillion, that's 18 zeros, one quintillion times above natural background radiation, according to Professor Ole Johansson of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. The highly dangerous biological effects of EMFs have been documented by thousands of studies since 1932, indicating that we may be facing a global health catastrophe, orders of magnitude worse than those caused by tobacco and cigarettes. 5G is designed to deliver concentrated and focused electromagnetic radiation in excess of 100 times current levels in the same way as do directed energy weapons. There is currently an international appeal signed by 237 EMF scientists from 41 nations urging the UN and particularly the WHO to exert strong leadership in fostering the development of more protective EMF guidelines, encouraging precautionary measures and educating the public about the considerable health risks, particularly the risks to children and fetal, fetal development. Sorry, because uh, we are talking with someone that is a little bit ignorant on these things. You're talking to the Wi-Fi systems? I become worried because I put those devices in my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
I, this I will have to, I mean, I'm, I confess my ignorance on this. Uh, we will have to, uh, I, I, I'm go, but I'm going to raise this with WHO, which I think is the organization that might be able to deal with it properly, because I must confess, I was not aware of that danger. In 1996, when the Telecommunications Act was passed, in it was a provision essentially that kept local officials from addressing health issue concerns when approving or not approving a cell tower. So that's, that's but, correct. But then something new is happening. We've talked a lot about it on the Solari Report. Thanks, to Jason Bowden Smith and his website EMF Warriors. But but this is new. This is very very new. So you're you're basically you know, sending out an appeal on something that in one sense hasn't happened yet. This is not just an incremental change. This is a big step up. It's it's a sea change. Uh, and, and onslaught's not an improper word. It's, it's a bombardment. So instead of a cell tower one mile or two miles from you and you still have cell phone service, we're going to have antennas every block and some poor soul is going to have one mounted to utility, utility pole maybe less than 20 meters from their home. So this kind of you know invasive bombardment with this many antennas, I mean, just in one square mile, if you do the math, one per block and 16 blocks per mile, that's about 250 antennas per square mile. The millimeter wave is untested. Former FCC chairman Tom Wheeler openly said that they don't plan to test. We won't wait for the standards. And then our appeal also addresses the fact that there's a plan to roll out 5G through satellites in low Earth orbit. So 20,000 satellites, which will cover every square foot of the planet with a 5G signal. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Night after night, politicians and other leaders were telling Americans that Sputnik revealed that we were at great risk. Not just our pride, but our security is at stake. Russia wins dominance of this completely new area? Well, I think the consequences are fairly plain. Probable Soviet world domination. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Welcome everybody to the White House. This is a uh, White House 5G Summit. My name is Justin Clark. I'm the Director of Public Liaison and we are thrilled to have you here today. Really happy to be joined by a lot of leaders in industry, members of Congress and the Senate, uh, White House leaders on this and uh, people from the FCC. Before we start, one, we are government, so don't assume we know anything, okay? I do agree, I don't know anything. I have become accustomed to giving speeches in my new position on subjects about which I frankly know very little. And we need more cell towers and connections in Connecticut, my home state. It's ridiculous. The U.S. is in the lead thanks to our private sector as well as the work of the FCC and this administration overall. But China and South Korea and many other countries are eager to claim this mantle. We have every intention to deploy 5G first and reap the benefits of faster and more robust wireless. Yes, I hope we beat China, of course, and get to giga, giga, gigabit speeds and low latency, and the race has begun. Let there be no mistake, the race to 5G is a sprint. Winning the global race to 5G, it's a national priority. We must bear in mind the national security implications of winning the race on 5G. Today we're talking about the importance of being first in 5G, continued commitment to putting America first in the race to 5G. We're calling it America first, 5G first. Well, our strategy is called the 5G Fast Plan, a plan to facilitate America's superiority in 5G technology. Connected devices for health applications, which I love, has the capacity to make people healthier, as I understand it, a lot of medical applications. The industry is not asking the government for money to build 5G networks. They're asking us to cut the red tape that surrounds infrastructure deployment. We cannot let today's red tape strangle the 5G future. The red tape slows and sometimes stops the building of densified network facilities necessary for 5G. As we continue our efforts to keep government out of the way, 
so that America can continue its leadership for America to win the race to 5G. One path is the government regulatory path. The other path is the private enterprise free market. Gales of creative destruction, Schumpeter path. You ever heard that? Gales of creative destruction? It just means let it rip. The new replaces the old. With 5G, we're on the cusp of another era of American innovation. It means an even more connected world for everyone around us, unlocking the potential of the Internet of Things to become safer, healthier, and more sustainable for our future. You know, sometimes, look, we all believe in the Tenth Amendment, but sometimes you have to override. By the way, the 1996 bill permits that kind of override. We're not here to be uh, completely heavy-handed, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. And some of these states or cities that don't want to cooperate want to shake us down. We can't allow obstacles and barriers to stop this movement. That's all. And this happened in Canada. I mean, there were some activists I was working with up there that said, well, you know, we, we, we won a victory. We got the local, the Public Utilities Commission to allow us to opt out. And I said, boy, you, that's divide and conquer. They just got rid of the, the, the people that were raising hell. So, you know, that's not, a, that's not the answer. We need to opt out everybody. An opt out is an agreement to pay to not be harmed. An opt out is volunteering into extortion. An opt out says that if I don't pay you, you have the right to harm me. So that, that doesn't work. This is a mandate. This is being pushed down your throat by a company that is not responsive, by a government that is not responsible, and it's being done in a collusion that's designed to undermine the individual rights of individual people in communities across the country and around the world. The Minister for the Environment has a duty. His duty is primarily to ensure that there is cleaner, better, healthier environment for people in this country. It's a simple duty. He also has a responsibility in regard to science and innovation to make sure that that happens. What seems to be happening here, in fact one could say undoubtedly happening here, is he's using science and innovation to ensure that our right to life is threatened. There have been no public debates. There is no public discourse. There are no public disclosures as to why, when, how, what is going on in regard to 5G. That by itself is a breach of ministerial responsibility and one which we really should look at in terms of a private prosecution against the ministers who have failed to protect our right to life. Okay, smart, smart technology, smart meters, smart cars, not that smart, huh? What does smart mean? Anything that has smart attached to it, secret militarized armaments in residential technology. That's where smart came from. And smart, every bit of technology that you see today has all, all been developed for either some type of battlefield, some type of intelligence gathering system, and obviously, these developments have to be commercialized and people have actually took them uh, into their homes. The definition of a smart grid is a wireless system that will fundamentally turn every single appliance in your home into the equivalent of a transmitting cell phone. That's every every computer, every television, every furnace, every air conditioner, every coffee machine, every printer, every single appliance that you have in your house will eventually, in a smart grid, have an antenna that's embedded into it that will transmit your usage data to a smart meter on the outside of your home that will then transmit your usage data to another tower receiving a usage signal that will then go to the utility company for supposedly billing purposes. Not all signals will just be about your individual use. There will be aggregate uh, meters that will bounce signal from house to house to house within a neighborhood that will then accumulate all of the usage data that will transmit that to the utility company. Now, what that will do is that the end metering system that is transmitting all of that data will be firing an RF signal at many, many times a second, which will increase the average homeowner's radio frequency radiation exposure exponentially. This picture shows some aphids on the leaf of an orange tree shortly after radar equipment was installed at a nearby airport a number of years ago. 
I noticed that every few seconds, all the aphids would tense up in unison and do sort of a little dance, as you see in the picture. Upon further investigation, I found that the interval of time between the activity of each dance coincided exactly with the rotation of the radar rotor device at the airport, which was a distance of approximately 14 miles. The antenna arrays create this steerable beam, which helps concentrate the energy. The, the beams get pointed at the user. What's a MIMO tank? Massive in, massive out. British government have got a plan to roll 400,000 out. This is so that you've got 5G in every nook and cranny, every part of the countryside, so that you can have autonomous tractors, believe it or not. However, those transmitters, these are radar. It is phased array radar. Though that radar signal sweeping the countryside will kill every pollinator, every biological structure, it will sterilize livestock, it will kill the ground, so consequently land won't have a value, uh, obviously farmers will die, the community will be under attack. The community will be under attack. If we can't produce food, if we kill all the pollinators, we're in serious trouble. The takeaway is that 5G, the trillion dollar rollout of 5G by our friendly local government is definitely a weapon system masquerading as a modern efficiency technology. It most certainly is. And what I'll put it down to, it's economic terrorism. There is no value, nil, in killing off your population, in destroying your ability to grow food to kill all your pollinators. They may have a nice financial number on a piece of paper, but in reality, dementia, diabetes, all the things that are currently crippling the NHS, a burden on the country, illness, mental health issues, the, the, the focus of that cause can be identified and has been identified in the science. The science is proven the epidemiological data that was seen on the street is now substantiating that science. The DNA inside you, the mitochondrial DNA, you can trace unchanged to your mother, her mother, her mother, right the way back to the beginning of the human race in Africa, the Stone Age. It is unchanged, the mitochondria. And that is being unchanged in your children which means if you damage it, your child could be genetically damaged, then her child, and her child, and her child, forever. You are condemning the future generations of every single child. There is, however, a light uh, at the end of the tunnel, or there is uh, some ray of hope. Thanks to the principles of biological quantum entanglement uh, that we have learned how to exploit in the field of biology and medicine, now we can transfer the information from the microbial DNA to the human DNA. And uh, in so doing, uh, we can train, so to speak, the microbes to withstand uh, whatever extreme condition they are exposed to, including this new technology. And then we can train them to transfer this resilience of theirs to our DNA. So let's say that uh, there are good reasons to be worried about uh, the introduction of these uh, new technologies, but fortunately, since uh, the knowledge in the field of quantum biology, in the field of micro or microbiome medicine is advancing as fast as potentially harmful technology, then we can exploit this knowledge to protect ourselves from any real potential or perceived danger from these new technologies. I've met with uh, molecular and cellular biologists, with uh, blood microscopists, uh, with weapons development uh, experts, uh, frontline activists and researchers, and all the stories I'm hearing from these experts and pundits leads to the same thing. 5G is almost certainly the end game. It is an extinction event brought into our homes, into our classrooms, onto the high street, into the very cells and DNA in our human bodies. 
It is such a perilous threat that it is almost impossible to imagine, let alone describe. When the 5G signature goes live, it will tap into a multitude of satellites which are in geosat orbit around the surface of the Earth. Uh, millions of surface antennas will pick up uh, that signaling and will then uh, scatter the signaling into uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of different micro antenna systems uh, set up on street lamps and even in your home, which you're not aware of incidentally. The LED light bulbs in your home invariably contain the micro or nanotech lens flare capacitors which will receive the 5G signaling and it will proliferate the 5G signaling everywhere by uh, exploding the signal into uh, billions of photons which will target everything all at the same time. This is stealth technology, this is invisible uh, science, but what it means in simple terms is that you will be flagged up, uh, visible, uh, trackable inside your own home, anywhere you move on the surface of the earth, they will have a lock and load tracking capability over you. You will be visible to invisible masters, each one of us, all the time. Today, our governments and uh, the corporate sector have managed somehow to infiltrate the mainframe of our civilization and are pushing through a $20 trillion infrastructural rollout without any, and I mean without any, health science running behind it. There have been no tests. Your government and your health authorities are either in collusion on this matter of genocide and ecocide, or they're just damned stupid, and I would suggest it is the latter. Shame on the technologists and the uh, electricians who are uh, furthering this technology in our homes, in our offices, in our streets. Shame on the legislators and the parliamentarians and the troglodytes and bureaucrats that proliferate our society today. Shame on that echelon for putting their signatures uh, to contracts which allow the fast tracking of this technology into our homes and onto our high streets. Shame on the parliamentarians and international leadership whose wet ink signatures and seals of office are sanctioning and permissioning uh, the rollout of something which is uh, arguably the greatest threat to humankind. Shame on each one of us who now fail to get up uh, out of our homes, walk out of our front doors and challenge every so-called authority who dares to violate our bodies, our homes and our future generations.